just talking with him. He had really good understanding. He was asking really good questions. Yes. And so, here's something I want to tell you guys. A way you can honor your parents is, you know, it says in the Bible that Jesus listened to his mom and Joseph ever since then, and he submitted to them in everything it would tell it was time for him to become a grown-up. So just like Jesus, you can honor your moms and your dads by listening to them and do really good things, okay? Oh, okay. You want to come up here and teach? No, you do? Oh, not yet? Okay, well, maybe someday. I think you've got a lot to say. All right, well, we love you guys. You have a good class, okay? <laughs> That's like one of my favorite parts of service. I don't know why they, uh, they, they did that show, Kids Say the Darndest Things, for so long. Well, today, um, did you get that started, Ronnie? All right, we're, we're live streaming for some folks who couldn't make it out today because of health reasons. So I know there's a lot of new things going on, so I apologize if I appear to be in like 20 different directions at once. But uh, luckily, the Word of God can ground us, right? And today what we're going to do is we're going to do something a little different. I know we're going to the Gospel of John, but next week would have been our Mother's Day lesson, and next week's not Mother's Day. So I think y'all can forgive me, because Jesus does, if I skip ahead and then go back next week. So we're going to go open that right up. We're going to talk about Jesus and his relationship to his mother. I think that's important to talk about. Because sometimes we, we think that, well, Jesus did this, but I can't. But something we need to realize about Jesus is he was both God and man at the same time. The only reason I think partly we don't think about it so often is because we don't know much of Jesus' early life apart from what we just talked about with the kids. But think about this. Mary, the mother of God, as she was praying, was approached by the angel Gabriel who told her the news that she would be bearing a son. In a time when being a single mother meant you could be stoned to death. But I love the words she told the angel after he explained how it would happen. She said this, I am the Lord's servant. Isn't that awesome? Jesus still needed to be raised. He had earthly parents through Mary and Joseph. And oh my goodness, I couldn't imagine. Uh, the Bible tells us that Jesus had brothers and sisters. Could you imagine Jesus being your eldest brother? Could you imagine like when the younger siblings are fighting and uh, Mary said, well, you know, Jesus would, sorry, mom, we all can't be perfect like Jesus. I mean, that'd be a, a hard thing. I mean, all of us have siblings that, some of us are those siblings, but all of us have siblings that think they're perfect, right? We're the perfect child. How many of you are those siblings? How many of you have those siblings? Okay, virtually everybody has a hand or a finger raised. Some of them aren't, aren't raising because they don't want to see anyone to see. But I think we need to understand that Jesus was fully human. That's a, a concept that's difficult for us to grasp. But I'm going to tell you the reason why it's important that we look at this aspect of Jesus' life is because for the covenant contract of the Old Testament with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to have been fulfilled, the sin came from Adam, and Adam had to fix the sin. That's why Paul in the book of Romans calls Jesus the second Adam. We just can't imagine that, though. Jesus played with other kids growing up. Jesus took first steps. As a human, he said first words. And this woman, Mary, who said, I am the Lord's servant, had the honor of raising that child. And so I think Mary deserves a little bit of honor. Now, we don't um, say prayers to her as some are in the habit of doing, but I think it's time we kind of look at how Jesus even honored his mother. We spoke a little bit earlier the life of Jesus when um, Mary had mistaken Jesus for being in the caravan home and, and went back and found Jesus there. But there's another time we can look at. Open your Bibles to John chapter 2. We're going to look at the wedding of Cana. This was also consequently Jesus' first miracle. It says, On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. 
Jesus said to her, Woman, what, of this, what has this to do with me? My hour has not yet come. That sounds a little snarky. If I talked to my mother like that, I probably would have had little five or five finger marks right here on this cheek. But I don't think Jesus was being disrespectful. When he says woman, he's probably saying that with an affectionate term. He, he's trying to let her know that it's not yet his time. He was already baptized. He called some disciples, but he had not yet begun his teaching ministry. And yet, here's what happens. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Mary knew there was something different about her son. And I think this was one of those Holy Spirit moments. I'm not sure if you know what I'm talking about, but there's just moments when you know something's going to happen, when God's going to do something great, and you can anticipate it. I think Mary had one of those little moments of insight. You see, wine was the common drink of the day. They didn't drink water. They usually drank a form of mixed wine because water was uh, dirty and disgusting. And to have water, you had to do all sorts of things to it or you could get sick. And so often what they would do is they would bring out the strongest wine first and then slowly dilute it so people wouldn't get a little too happy at the wedding. And so as they ran out, Mary knew Jesus couldn't go down to the 7-Eleven, you know or the Piggly Wiggly, or whatever else there, there might have been in the day. So now there were six stone, waters jar, uh, stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. As a matter of fact, could we stand for the reading of today's word? That's uh, something I typically do, and I, uh, I really want to continue doing that because God's word is amazing. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of the signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glories, and his disciples believed him in, and all God's people said, please be seated. I think it's important that Jesus' mother instituted the very first miracle that Jesus occurred. Why? Because if you think about it, she's the one who saw him give Birth, And I'm going to tell you something about uh, Jesus' relationship with his mother, but also with women, is if you think about this, in the Garden of Eden, who was deceived first? It was the woman. Eve was deceived first, and then her husband, Adam. And isn't it fitting that God's plan begins with the woman instituting the miracles? You see, I think since... You know, I heard this joke the other day. and They said uh, there's a reason why women don't like deciding where to eat because the first time they did, they messed it up. <laughs> don't throw anything at me, please. But I think it's interesting how God has a way of rectifying all wrongs. Through Mary came the birth of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit came upon her and filled her, and thus she gave birth to a son, even though she hadn't been with her husband, Joseph. And on that day at the wedding in Cana, Mary instituted the first miracle. How awesome is God's plan? It's almost like He does things on purpose. And so, we can see see that God is already at work restoring things. Now I'm going to talk about Jesus' relationship with his mother a bit, and then we'll get into the theological meat of everything. Jesus didn't always have the best relationship with his mother. If you go to the Gospel of Mark, uh, when Jesus went to go preach at his hometown in Galilee, everyone thought he was crazy. And they went to stone him. And at one point, Jesus is sitting in a room with all his disciples. And his mother and brothers come to the door requesting him. And Jesus says something that sounds kind of rude. No, these are my mother and my brothers. Those who do the will of my father. You see, at that time, Mary and his brothers, I'm pretty sure heard from all the neighbors. Do you know what your son is doing? You need to get him home and tell him to stop. I've been one of those students at one point. 
in my younger days, granted, you know, Jesus was perfect and didn't mess up like I did, but we lived in Southern California, and some of you have been there, and some of you have lived there, so you know what I'm talking about. In Southern California traffic, all you could really do is put your car in neutral and let the earth spin to get anywhere. And as a young, impetuous man, and I wasn't even driving a car that belonged to my parents, I don't know how somebody knew me in this, there must have been at least a thousand cars on this one mile, or maybe more, but on this, you know, maybe five mile stretch. So I decided to take the emergency lane and get to the nearest exit because I was tired of sitting in traffic. I get a phone call on my cell phone. It's my dad. He says, somebody saw you driving this car and doing that. That was disrespectful. Now, I could imagine, though, Jesus' feelings at the time. His mother and his brothers. He went to Galilee to preach to the people there, to give them the good news. And we find out in the Gospels that the people of his hometown didn't believe in him, and so he couldn't perform many miracles. As a matter of fact, they went to throw him off a cliff and stone him, and he somehow got through the crowd and got away from them. Could you imagine the pressure his mother and brothers must have been under? When they came to get him, Jesus said, no, I need to fulfill my father's will. He was still obedient to his mother, of honoring of his mother, but he didn't obey his mother. Now, there's only one more time, really, we see in the life of Jesus where uh, Mary and Jesus are interacting, and the last time we see them interacting is on the cross. Oh, and what a time that was. The only one of Jesus' disciples who was at the foot of the cross was John. And as Jesus is suffering in agony, he looks down at his mother and he says to John, this is your mother. And he says to his mother, this is your son. And from that day, John took Mary into his household. So even in his dying thoughts, Jesus was thinking of his mom. How appropriate for Mother's Day is that? Jesus thought well of his mom. Why? Because we find out in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, that Paul calls uh, the, the commandment, honor your father and mother, the first commandment with a promise. Why? Because it says, so you will live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. When we learn to honor our parents, when we learn, uh, and that's why I chose for the, the scripture this morning, Proverbs 31, when our children, our mom's children rise and call her blessed, it's because she has taught them the ways of God. And let's face it, moms are typically our first teachers because dads are typically the providers. That doesn't happen um, as often as it used to. But moms nurture, moms care for, moms pick up. And so I, I love that Jesus' first miracle and last thoughts on the cross were of his mother. I'm sure his mother taught him, as every good Jewish mom did. When you were little, they taught you through the Torah so you could learn to speak. So his first teacher in the Word of God in the Old Testament was his, was his mother. She taught him the Bible stories as he was growing up and learned to speak. You see, I want to highlight this before we get into our, our meat and potatoes of this. Because moms, we need to honor you. Some of you are single moms. Some of you are moms that have uh, had some hard times lately and, and you're going through some things. But God honors mothers. And I think we should too. So if you're a mom this morning, can I ask you just to stand up? A mom, a grandmother, if you've taken kids into your house at some point, would you please stand up so we can honor you? Thank you for everything you do, and God bless you. Now, I love this miracle that Jesus performed, and this is the meat and potatoes of it, because God was speaking through this miracle. These stone basins that these um, servants got were used for washing. It was made for people to wash their hands and their necks. If you didn't wash a certain way in Jewish custom, you couldn't eat because you were ritualistically unclean. But in this process, Jesus took what was meant to wash somebody and he used it to be a big blessing. These stone jars were meant for purification. And so is it a wonder that Jesus called for their use? They weren't small jars, by the way. They were probably roughly about four foot, four and a half foot tall. And so they filled those to the brim. Could you imagine being a servant having to lug those around? 
And yet when the master of the feast tasted the wine, it was the best wine he had tasted. My guess would probably be his entire life, but at least that day. Why? Because Jesus was speaking to something. He was saying uh, uh, what, what uh, Paul had said in Ephesians chapter 6, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, washing her with water through the word. Do you see the connection now? Jesus took wash basins full of water and he spoke of a covenant that was coming. Oftentimes, uh, throughout the New Testament, you read in the Gospels, Jesus talks about new wine and old wineskins, or old wine and new wineskins, they don't mix. Jesus uses wine to speak of a new covenant. Even as uh, Brother West talked, and thank you, West, that was awesome. As Brother West talked, Jesus used the wine to speak of the new covenant in his blood. Jesus was saying, things are changing. Something new is coming. The word of the prophets will be fulfilled. The new covenant was beginning. And I'm going to tell you why this is important, church. Sometimes this is one of those little Bible stories. Well, that's pretty neat. Jesus turned water into wine. I even saw a picture of a, it looked like probably a Rite Aid or a Walgreens. And they had a, a label water. And on that shelf underneath the water label was wine. Someone said, Jesus must have been here. Silly joke. I don't care. I'm going to tell it. <laughs> But what Jesus was trying to tell people was that you cannot live in the old life and still have a new one. If you think about this, water and wine speak of things, they speak of newness. Back in those days, wine was more significant than it is now. Wine, uh, when, when the, the grape was fermented, killed and destroyed diseased water. That's why they would water it down. It made people able to drink and still nourish themselves. And oftentimes, I think this is what we do, church. We give our lives to Jesus and still try and wear the same old clothes we wore before. When Jesus made new wine, he was saying, I've come to make all things new. And in Jesus' time, I'm not sure if, if you know how this was, but uh, the, the books of the law and the prophets were, were the Old Testament, but they added a recent addition in Jesus' time. It was a tradition book called the Tanakh. No, excuse me, the Talmud. There was the Torah, which was the first five, and the Tanakh, which was the law, the prophets, Psalms, and all that. They added their own set of traditions, and the traditions were stifling people from worship. Could you imagine if we came to church, and we said you had to dress in this certain manner, I mean, not so long ago is how it was. You had to uh, have your hair cut this way, you had to walk this way, you had to do this. As a matter of fact, when you came in, we checked your tithes and offerings at the door, and if they weren't found to be good enough, we'd offer you some more at retail value. That's what was going on in Jesus' day. At temple worship, people would bring their lambs in for sacrifice, and the sacrifice was a daily part, and people would come in and bring the best of their flocks, and they would have these men there inspecting all of them, and they'd find a blemish that wasn't there. And they say, sorry, your lamb is not good enough for the slaughter, but you can come buy one of ours. And what, what's more is if you came from a foreign country because Jews were all over the Roman Empire and beyond, and you had to trade money from one region to the next, they would say, sorry, your money's no good here, but you can come to our money changers, and they'll give you a fair price. What's more is you had traditions like those watering jars where you had to ritualistically wash yourselves in ways that Moses would never have asked in order to just simply get before God to confess your sins. And so the unclean stayed outside of the gates. It's amazing that this first miracle was at a party. Because oftentimes Jesus was ridiculed for who he would go and quote unquote party with. He would hang out with the tax collectors and sinners of all sorts. And the religious of Jesus' day who were stuck in that old wine would look at who he was hanging out with and complain about it. But what would Jesus reply with? Is it the healthy who need a doctor or the sick? You see church, we have to look to the new wine. The new wine is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets are found within these two. Sometimes though, church, we can get stuck in that old wine. 
Things like we've always done it this way. Things like, well, my dad used to do this at church and he served here and I'm not picking on anyone in particular. I've just been at quite a few churches. And since he did this, I have to do it. Sometimes the way in which we offer our worship to God can be like trying to use that old watered down wine. But Jesus wants to bring us new mercies every day. Jesus wants to bring us to the good wine last, not just simply water things down for us. Jesus wants us to come and drink and be filled. We're going to read in a, a couple of weeks about that woman at the well in Samaria. Jesus asks her this question. I think he's asking us today, if you knew who was offering you, you would have asked him to give you living water and that would well up inside of you and fill to overflowing Church, sometimes we come to church and we have our faces like we've been baptized in vinegar. How's the joy of the Lord flowing out of us? If we have been saved, why don't we act like it? Jesus did his first miracle at a party. There was a celebration and weddings are quite the, the series for it. And this was also speaking of the next thing because guess what? Jesus has a bride and that bride is you and he's coming back. And when he comes back, he told his disciples, this is the last supper. I will not taste the vine until I come into my own. Why? Because when he comes together, it's going to be a celebration. So church, let's be filled with the joy of the Lord. Let's get away and put aside any differences that we might have or, or maybe uh, get away from we've always done this way and let's look for God's word and listen to the Holy Spirit as he speaks to us as we pour through it. Let's be the family of God that he's calling us to be. You see, the church, as the bride of Christ, we're to be waiting. And how are we to be waiting? If we're subdued in our worship, if we're... Solemn all the time. There's times for that. But Ecclesiastes also tells us to everything there is a season and a purpose under heaven. There is a time to mourn, but there's also a time to weep. And there's a time for joy and there's a time for sorrow. There's times for everything under the sun. But right now, in the presence of the Lord, while we still have Him, where is our joy? Are we living as if we've drunk the new wine? Or are we still trying to combine the new and the old? So church, I want to ask you this morning. That's all I got to say. I don't have much else. What are you drinking from? Are you trying to dip in the watered down old ways of doing things? I'm going to tell you something. This is also, wow, thank you, Jesus. This just came to my heart as I'm saying this. Is sometimes we drink watered down wine when we come to church. This is what I mean. It's not my responsibility to teach you or to, to teach you only exclusively the Word of God. You, I'm, I'm assuming, have Bibles at home. And if you don't have a Bible at home, you have a phone where you have access to it. God wants you to be drinking on His Word. He wants you to be getting into the Word and getting fed from His Word and getting satisfied from His Word. You don't follow Brian Doyle. God willing, you're following Jesus Christ. And that's also what Jesus wants us to come and drink from. He talks about this, and this actually got a lot of his followers. He says, come feast on my flesh and drink of my blood. What he's talking about is coming to the word of God on your own and having some time with the Lord that he may feed you through his Holy Spirit. God doesn't just simply want you to come and on Sunday mornings and check off a box. Church is who we are. It's 24 hours a day, seven days of work. When I go home and love my wife, that's church. When I raise my children, that's church. It's the reason why the New Testament is full of husband and wife analogies. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 5. He says, I'm telling you a great mystery when he's talking about husbands and wives, but I'm speaking of Christ and the church. Everything we should do should be church. When we get together and greet, we had coffee on Saturday morning. That was church. We didn't talk about much of anything, and then we talked about everything. Church is not something we come to once a week. It's who we are. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And my challenge to you this morning is this. Go to Christ and drink the new wine. Live that life that is filled with joy. Act as though you have been saved. And watch how Jesus Christ 
makes himself known in all aspects of your life. He didn't save us so that we could be subdued. He saved us to set us free. I'm going to invite the band to come up here, and I want to give you a challenge this morning. If maybe you have been trying to work out your own salvation, if you've been trying to, to be a good enough Christian, stop. You can't be good enough. You cannot do anything to work out your own salvation apart from give your life to Christ, lay it down and walk away from it and let Him deal with it. Jesus is not merely the bridegroom, He's also the master of the feast. And He lays out such a table that is so good for us. But the problem is is we're trying to go pick out all the, 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 the stuff we want for ourselves. Sometimes we want to hear just a positive message. That's not what Jesus is about. Sometimes we want to just uh, give Jesus just the areas of our lives that we like and keep aside the ones that we don't, or vice versa. We think we can hide things from Him. The thing is, He sees what we do in secret. He's not about us coming to church on a Sunday morning and putting on a good face and acting like everything's okay. If you are broken, this is the place to be broken. We know the one who fixes things. If you are sick, this is the place to be sick. We know the great physician. But he's calling us now to sit down at his feet and say, Lord, I cannot do this on my own anymore. I can't please you enough. I can't do enough. I can't give enough. I can't do anything enough. I just want you. And watch how he, when you surrender everything and lay it at his feet, makes all things new. He brings out the best wine for last. But we've got to stop sipping from what's been watered down. I love you, church. This next song is talk about coming home. If you have been trying to do it all on your own, I want to invite you to come forward. Let the elders or myself come pray with you or pray for you. If you want to make a decision for Christ this morning, there's not a better time. And if your mom's here, what a great Mother's Day gift that would be. So let's stand and worship. And if God has moved your heart, please come forward this morning.